Well, Luke, I've got some big news for you. What is the news, Michael? Mel Gibson is going to be recast in Chicken Run 2. Oh, wow. I, I can't believe it. You know what, Michael? I, I thought we'd really struggle uh, to find some important news to talk about before we get into Rec Room for a Dream. Like, I, I that, is, that is a major major story. Uh, to be fair, it was on the, it was quite easy to find because it was on the front page of several international news websites. Um, it's it's causing quite a few shakes in the industry to find out that we won't get to experience Mel Gibson playing his classic Chicken Run character. That guy, you know, the hero. Love him. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I've got some news, by the way. Oh, yeah? Uh, there was a reason why Lily James wasn't in the Downtown Abbey film. Oh, what was that? Oh, I, I don't know the reason. There just was one. Oh, that, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I mean, usually there's there's a reason for these, these things. Uh, so much is happening now. Oh, it's it's so, yeah, I love it. I'm just so excited every single day with everything uh, that happens. So, sure. yeah. that's that. Hello and welcome to Select and Reflect, the movie review podcast where we look at films that have come out in the near and distant past, we give them a couple of watches and evaluate them beyond first impressions. I'm your host Michael and I'm joined as always by my co-host Luke and this week we are celebrating the 20 year anniversary of the famous Dofsky film uh, Requiem for a Dream. Luke, why don't you a thing or two about Requiem for a Dream? Uh, sure thing Michael, so you are correct, it is 20 years since Requiem for a Dream came out. Uh, it is a 2000 American psychological drama film directed by, uh, what do you call him before, Michael? Dofsky. I don't, uh, uh, it's a thing that the cool kids call him because it's like yeah. Darren Aronofsky. So the, the two Aarons cancel each other it's, out it's and very, it Dofsky. Yeah, it is a very annoying thing to say, isn't it? Darren Aronofsky. Yeah, I hate I, that. <laughs> it is awful. It's uh, almost as bad as when, um, you know, Gary Neville's dad is called Neville Neville. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, you do get things like that. So it is pretty, people should definitely stop it. Mm, they definitely should. Oh, uh, Lenny, Lenny Leonard and Carl Carlson. Ah, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, but those aren't real people, though. That's the difference. Yeah, that's uh, true. Anyway, Red Cream for a Dream stars Ellen Burstyn, Jared Leto, Jennifer Connelly, and Marlon Wayans. Do you want to have a guess, by the way, Michael, uh, how old Jared Leto is in this movie? 50. No, um, I mean, obviously, I'm assuming it's going to be some kind of surprising answer. I feel like he... he well, just I guess mean, what you to, think. to me, he looks kind of old, so I guess maybe like 20, 28? Yeah, he is... 28, yeah, probably. <laughs> He's probably 28. Yeah. Oh, okay. Or 28 and 29. Um, I, because that's the thing, he looked like 24 to me, or 23. Uh, and you may say, well, that's not much of a difference, but I say, yes, there is. No, so yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I am 24, and you're 24 as well. Correct. Exactly we are both 24, right. and we look nothing like Jared Leto in this film, though, so there's a flaw in your theory. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Uh, but yeah, I was just surprised at how we all yeah. actually looked. Uh, but maybe that's because of the weight loss. Uh, anyway, uh, this movie, like I said, stars him, uh, Ellen Burstyn, Jenny Colony, and Marlon Wayans. It's based on the 1978 novel of the same name by Herbert Selby Jr., with whom Aronofsky wrote the screenplay. Uh, it was released on October the 6th, 2000 in the United States, but it was released at the Cannes Film Festival on May the 14th, 2000. So yeah, just a little over two years uh, sorry, two years, uh, 20 years since it was released. Uh, and Michael, can you tell me what the budget was for Requiem for a Dream? Three million. 4.5. Oh, not bad. 4.5, yeah. So decent guess, obviously, it's going to be around that. Uh, Percentage-wise, actually, it was quite a while uh, off there. So, That's true, yeah. Yeah, you've got to think about it like that it way. It was like 450 million. I said 300 million. That would, be, that would be a pretty big oversight. Massive difference. But anyway, what is it? Uh, how much did it make at the box office, though? Uh, 24 million. Uh, no, actually quite a bit lower. It only oh. made seven point four million. Huh? <gasps> yeah. How does he how did he have a career after this? After that know, massive right? bomb. I mean when I you know. take into account marketing, mm. they didn't get their money back. Yeah. I mean God, that is not really a, a lot, is it? So how come then, Michael? How come we're reviewing this movie? It's you know, it's at least twenty years ago, I made so little. Uh how, how it's because it's because um, the Simpsons episode uh, parodied the pupil dilating weird bloodstream thing in their Ribwitch episode, and people found that so funny. They're like, <laughs> he's eating a sandwich, and it's like he's taking drugs. So then they wanted to know where it came from, so they and found this film, and that's how we ended up where we are now. Yes, well, uh, last week I called Requiem for a Dream a unique movie, and I think that is a fair uh, analysis of it. Uh, because this movie... Well, uh, let's ask the question, Michael. Uh, did you like Requiem for a Dream? 
Ah, no. No? I didn't like this film. No, you didn't like it. No, wow. I I didn't I didn't like it. No, Um, if I had to describe this film in one word, it would be goofy, and I don't think that's what the film wanted me to think it was. Hey, okay, so we're going down a different path. I thought you were going to say it was harrowing and awful, and that's why I didn't like it. But you're saying it's goofy. I was laughing so hard. Like for me. Like are that's you, the weird thing. About the <laughs> no, I'm being genuine. I was oh, wow. at the end of the film. I I felt like I was watching like a so bad it's good movie. Like, okay. I, I mean, that's the thing for me. It's and and it's crazy because I wasn't I wasn't expecting that when I, I mean I've seen some other of, the, of this this fine young gentleman's films before and I I would say usually those films are I do find quite harrowing. I mean you know you got the old Black Swan. It's pretty mental. I didn't really like Black Swan, but it, it, was, it was pretty mental. This film, I just, I really did find it quite goofy. <laughs> but what do you think, Luke? Well, here's the thing. I thought you were going to say I didn't like it because it, like I said, it was harrowing. And I have to say that uh, after I watched it, I was like, yeah, I don't want to see that again. Why did I just put myself through that? Uh, but I appreciated some aspects, but I did have some criticisms as well. But yeah, I, I have to say, Michael, I did not end up laughing. So yeah, we're in, we're in two different ends. We're in like very different parts of the spectrum, and I yet didn't we even both know there was a spectrum that you're in. Right? Yeah, I I mean that's the thing. Like I feel like I have, and I was kind of aware of this going into it. I was watching. I was just like, and I just oh boy. Okay, let's talk about this film. Luke. Oh, do you have any nitpicks? Uh, I have two nitpicks. Oh really? You have two? See, I have two nitpicks. Um, the funny thing is, I didn't write any nitpicks on my second watch, and I didn't really read my nitpicks. So okay. let's hope they're good. All right. Because yeah, so these are from the, the first watch. Oh yeah, yeah. So seeing, well, yeah. See, so you don't have any nitpicks, which is crazy. So I guess I'll go. Seeing as I'm the only one who can go, I think that's the best thing to do. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So like, first one, it's kind of minor, but like the the whole he lacks sugar and then she's really hungry. So it's like, oh, it's no sugar and it's really hungry. Even though like an egg is is pretty substantial for breakfast. Like I just found it weird the way it was like the diet was. It was like, oh, she's immediately going to be hungry because of this diet. Even though, when you look at what the diet was, that's that's not a bad breakfast. Like that's about as much as I. Well, I, I obviously I don't really eat eggs as much. Well, I don't know. What I said obviously, but yeah, I don't, that's about as much as I say a normal person eats for breakfast. Yeah, like one boiled egg. Um, and a yeah, grapefruit. but these are that Americans, like... Michael. <laughs> uh, oh, well, you you found that funny, did you? Yes. Okay. Oh, this one. Oh, this one's this one's crazy because I must have googled this after the first watch. See, the thing is, I should clarify. I, I like to have my first and second watches a little bit removed from each other, so I always kind of forget the experience of watching it first time I don't forget but like sometimes I'm shocked where it's so I wrote because I, I think I googled this uh and I must have googled this because I was curious when I saw this guy get amputated he gets his arm amputated at the end spoiler alert uh there's old Jared Leto and I was like hmm that, that's weird because it's not something you hear about is it you don't you know because because nowadays we've all got these you know don't do drugs things so I was thinking if, if you were really at risk of losing your arm from um from heroin you, you would think that would be a thing people talk about and I was looking it up and I, I couldn't find anything about it, like anything to suggest that's like a, a reasonable thing that happens. It's kind of a nitpick. And also I think you could say, well, you know, it's because of the unique circumstances and stuff like that. But yeah, it's not like a, it's not like a thing that happens regularly. Whereas usually with a cautionary tale about drugs, you'd think it would be like, oh, it's something that happens regularly with drugs. But in this case, it's like, well, if you do drugs and also this very specific and rare thing happens to you, you'll lose your arm. So I don't know. Mm-hmm. Mind my, my thing, but whatever. What are your lit picks? Okay, uh, yeah, so I've got two lit picks, as I said. Um, and, I mean, the, like, I, like, well, nit picks, they don't really ruin a film. And lit picks no. don't really add to the film, but I yeah. thought I'd put them down. Uh, big news from last week, by the way. Oh, well, uh, continuing on from last week, I should say. Uh, the Sicilian Mafia makes a return. We talked about them last week in 365 Days. Massimo, uh, a member mm. of the Sicilian Mafia. Um, who ca- uh, who kidnaps uh, Laura, the Polish girl, in that wonderful movie? Uh, and apparently, they return in this movie because I was looking on the Wikipedia page. Uh, the people who shoot um, the drug dealer who Tyrone is in the car with midway through the movie, apparently, they are the Sicilian Mafia. Yeah. So there you go. We're two for two. Will they return next week in Showgirls? Uh, we'll wait and see. Um, you know, it's it's very realistic that they could because Showgirls is about you know like sex. And the Sicilian yeah. Mafia does like sex, as we established in 365 days. She'll, oh. the, uh, she'll be walking alone in uh, something like, oh, you lost the baby girl. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, they could be like at how Forrest Gump, you know, is in all those uh, memorable American moments in, uh, in the 60s and 70s. 
That could be the Sicilian yeah, Mafia I, in all the movies we review. I, I, could be the start I'm of it. excited for it. Yes. Uh, okay, we'll see you uh, about that next week. Uh, and my second lit pick, um, during, uh, this is from uh, Wikipedia, apparently during the grocery store scene when Jared Leto and uh, Tyrone try to get the drugs uh, and there's a shootout, uh, apparently real drug addicts were brought in as extras. And Aronofsky has recalled Seems that... Seems unnecessary. S- yeah, I know, but no, no, this is... This okay. Is, Aronofsky has recalled that some were injecting themselves during filming. And I have to say, that is dedication from Aronofsky. Yeah. Not just well, to bring yeah. in drug addicts. You didn't addicts want to, you didn't want to use those, uh, those CGI drug addicts, that's the thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's like, wow. I mean, not only were they drug addicts, they were injecting themselves during the filming. That is... Yeah. Uh, I- that is that is, I, I, you know what, you may say that's over the top, but I was like, wow, if you want to make a movie as realistic as possible, fair play. Fair play. Yeah, but it's kind of weird. It's like weird on, okay, so the, the one positive would be like, oh, you know, maybe he, they got some money out of it, which I guess you could say maybe that doesn't really matter because they, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like the angry guy who doesn't want to give to homeless people, but, you know, they just spend it on drugs, as the kids are saying. However, you know, ultimately, you know, whatever, they want to do drugs, give them some money to star in a film, whatever. But it's kind of weird, like, it's kind of weird to have a film that's obviously very, Ne- critical of having drugs, to put it mildly, and to be like, yeah, we'll just get some actual drug addicts in there. Like, how did the how did the drug addicts feel being in this film? Like, oh yeah, it's gonna be a film about how great it is to take drugs, right? Yeah, I love drugs. Darren Oscar, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's uh, yeah. Thanks for coming. Yeah. I mean, look, I doubt they care. To be honest, no, yeah, they don't care. Drugs, yeah. they were too busy just exactly. being high, having yeah, fun. Exactly. Yeah, they could say, hey man, I was in a movie today. And their fellow yeah. drug. He's like, no, you weren't. Man. You're just fucking high, man. You can't say that. Like, I was going to be on TV. <laughs> You're going to see me there. <laughs> okay. Uh. Yes. Yes. Oh, that that would be a good movie then. Yeah. Yeah. yeah the, the like parallel. about a, <laughs> one of the drug addicts in in that movie. Yeah. yeah. It's like I'm going to Darren Aronofsky's cast me in his in his recent film. I got to make sure I'm skinny enough to fit in my old rags <laughs> that I have to wear when I'm shooting up. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great. So. Uh, that is one of the plot lines in this movie, uh, and I guess we should get into the plot of Requiem for a Dream. Uh, from Wikipedia, uh, this is it. Uh, the film depicts four characters affected by drug addiction and how it alters their physical and emotional state. Their addictions cause them to become imprisoned in a world of delusion and desperation. As the film progresses, each character deteriorates and their reality is overtaken by delusion, resulting in catastrophe. Some sp- uh, pretty strong words there. Uh, I also want to read um, from a particular website where I may or may not have saw the movie illegally, um, and uh, they they give a description of it. And I thought this was a it was a good, really good description of the movie. Uh, drugs they consume the mind, body, and soul. Four lives, four addicts, four failures. Despite <laughs> their aspirations of greatness, they succumb to their addictions. Watching the addicts spiral out of control. We bear witness to the dirtiest, ugliest portions of the underworld addicts reside in. Uh-huh. It is shocking and eye-opening, but demands to be seen by both addicts and non-addicts alike. Uh, which I just found quite funny. That's pretty heavy. <laughs> yeah. It is. Oh, this is a movie about drugs. No, but this is this, this is shocking and must be seen. Uh, yeah, I imagine they copied and pasted that from somewhere. But yeah, so I guess yeah, that, that's wow. it. it it's, it's a, I mean, it is quite accurate how it is a pretty... Well, the description's heavy, and it is a pretty heavy movie, isn't it? It is like, heavy. It is. It's very. Um, there's a lot uh, yes, to, to put is, things mildly. Mm-hmm, there is a lot. Uh, so I guess with the plot, like the description said, there are four lives, there are four addicts, and there are four failures. Um, there's it all. Well, the central character is Jared Leto, whose character I believe is called Harry. Yes. Um, and Harry has a friend called Tyrone, who Tyrone. is black, and he has a uh, girlfriend. Mom. Oh, well, well yeah. He, he, I mean, he has both. Yes, he has a girlfriend uh, played by Jennifer Connelly uh, called Marion, and he ha- also has a mum, and uh, she is called what is she called, Michael? I forgot. Barbara. Is it actually Barbara? I, th- I think it's it's either Barbara or Sarah. It's Sarah. That's it. Sarah Goldfarb. Oh, good. Yeah, I'm yeah. glad I was. Yeah, I, I was thinking Barbara because you know I guess it's I knew it ended in Ara. So well done. Mate. <laughs> Um, and Aura, are you going to talk about these characters, Luke? Well, yes. I mean, the thing is that um, there's there's really, I mean, it revolves around these four characters, but really there is only two plot lines. And one is strictly about uh, Sarah Goldfarb and her descent uh, taking uh, speed, I believe it is. Uh, and uh, she gets, obviously, she wants to lose weight, as we were referring to before, because she's going to be on television. 
So she takes these drugs so she doesn't eat and then she drops a lot of weight. Uh, but also, um, that means uh, she becomes addicted eventually to uh, these drugs and she spirals out of control and ends up in a uh, mental institution. And then we have uh, the three other characters who are in their own separate plot thread. And uh, yeah, each of them uh, ends up really poorly at the end, but they're all kind of together. It's a, like I said, it's, yeah, it's a wholesome plot. story, really, because they're all together <laughs> in the end. They're all together in their misery. <laughs> yes. Right. Okay. So shall we get, get into what you have to say about the plot, Michael? Oh, okay. I, I guess, you know what? I, I think it does make sense to maybe split it into in twain. Um, and why don't we talk about the, the gold farb first, even though, sorry, I realize they're both called gold. Uh, Sarah first, just because, I don't know, I feel like that's, to me, it's, it's, it's the weirder one. Um, the, I couldn't help but find it kind of funny. Okay, right. Here's how, the- how she's afraid. Of, it, gen- like, to me, she's scared of her fridge and it, like, just the, I think, I think what it is, it's like, the the intensity of it combined with how silly that feels to me that she's like it's like this zooming in on her face she's like uh, uh, and then you just <laughs> you just see her fridge just there like <laughs> okay there was that shot of the fridge opening up and it had like fucking smoke and fire coming out of it where I was like oh that's a bit shit but the rest of it I I, was, I didn't laugh at it but yeah I mean here's the thing Michael I think you might like genuinely be a, uh, a psychopath i just i like <laughs> that's the thing i mean i don't know because because like i think about other films i like uh you know like films like manchester by the or you know the favorite okay. film we've reviewed so far is um uh free billboards outside of missouri and i feel like the reason i like those films is because i kind of i relate to the characters and so if anything i'm the opposite it's like because i relate to the characters and then i feel sorry for the characters when i go through the situation for me this film is like uh, it's so off the wall that I can't really relate to any of the characters because it's just, it's just all so insane. Like there's no moment where I'm like, Oh yeah, I kind of feel like I'm relating to these characters and like getting to know them just, just all the time they, they're going crazy. And then, uh, because it's so off the wall and, and because I can't relate to the characters because they just feel strange and weird and like they don't have, and obviously I know they do have moments where they are like kind of quiet moments and stuff, but it, it's, I, yeah, I didn't really like relate to any of the characters, which meant that everything I saw, I wasn't, I, I just, it to me, I could only focus on how weird and crazy and zany it was rather than like, oh man, imagine if that was actually happening to me because I didn't relate to any of the characters. And that's like the big thing at the center of the film to stop me being like, oh, that's sad. Instead, I just had to be like, look at that fridge. Okay, here's the okay. thing. So when I, yeah. wh- when did you first see this movie? Um, no, I actually first saw it um, for, for, this, uh, for this review. So, okay, so, it was for this review, yeah. So, um, I mean, so last a few week, months ago. Yeah, yeah. Last week I said when I, when we reviewed 365 Days, I asked you, "Are you glad I made you watch this movie?" Um, and this week I was planning to say that again because I was like, "Oh, he won't have enjoyed it." But it sounds like you actually didn't mind watching it because you got a laugh out of it. Yeah, that's that the correct? weird thing. I mean, because here's here's the thing about um, Dovsky in general. Um, right. I so I, I've seen like almost the only one I haven't seen is Mother, the the really recent one, but. Uh, a lot of the time when I watch these films, I find myself thinking, okay, they're crazy, but what's the point? Like, that was my opinion on, um, on Black Swan and Pi and that other one he did, The Fountain. Like, in each one, it's just like, okay, they're crazy. That's, that's like the point of the film. Noah but, as well. What's, must be actually Noah, Noah to build an Noah. arc. <laughs> yeah, it's so weird that he did Noah. Like, that's so strange to me. Just like, like in the middle of it, just this film. Anyway, but like, that's how I feel about a lot of them. Like, they're crazy, what's the point? But in a way. <laughs> I just, I, I just thought of a great joke with Noah. Like in, he's he's taking drugs and he's like looking at the animals. And he's like, oh my god, I'm seeing two of everything. <laughs> anyway, the important thing is that like um, a lot of the time he makes these films about crazy things, but I at least feel like they're they're crazy, but in a way where I'm like, oh man, this is crazy. It like in, in a disconcerting way. In this film, it's it is crazy, but it's it's so crazy that. I did, yeah, I guess I did get more enjoyment out of it than some of the other films. I guess I hate to say it, but in a way, yeah, I did get more enjoyment out of this than I did out of like Black Swan. Cause Black Swan, I was like, okay, yeah, sure. She's crazy. Oh, she imagined sleeping with Mila Kunis. What a weirdo. <laughs> Who would do that? But at the end of it, I was like, what was the point in that? Whereas this film, like, I know what the point in that was. It just really leaned into it and just went completely mental. And yeah, you know, okay. I, I felt like it had a direction it was going and that direction was just straight to the fun house. <laughs> Yes, that is that is that. And but okay, so you've said that you found the scenes of uh, Sarah Goldfarb when she's hallucinating yeah. the fridge and I guess the game show as well 
Um, do you find that? Fun? Yeah, I, I, I think cool. I, I was going to say, sorry, I don't want to, but basically there's there another thing about it, which um, I wanted to say. I think another thing is it, it wasn't necessarily that believable to me, largely because she seems to have quite a robust support network of friends, which I found very strange because like well, she says you, they're not really her friends. Uh, oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess that's a good point. But yeah, I was thinking like, ultimately she does seem to have these people who she can kind of hang out with and be like, hi there. Uh, which I would feel like if you're going to be an old lady who gets addicted to drugs, I would kind of think you'd be one of those old ladies who just like stays inside all day. And obviously she turns into that, but it's like, I don't know. I, I was surprised she got to that point, but that's kind of a minor thing, but I was just like, I don't know. It doesn't feel like it didn't feel authentic as like an actual story of how a woman would really get addicted to drugs. Cause I'm sure there are like old women who would get addicted to drugs, but it kind of felt like, like I, I struggle to believe that's how it would actually happen. So that's another thing just well, to I, I'm bear sure in mind. It, I'm sure it has. Yeah. Yeah. Probably. Like that. I'm sure, look, I, I mean, I'll get into it later with the uh talking about the modern well i guess 20 years ago you could argue it's still modern but the the modern drug problem that america has mm. and definitely people like sarah gulfar uh, could suffer um yeah so I, I don't think her story is necessarily unbelievable maybe the way it happens is un- unbelievable i'm not sure i'm not a doctor I, I don't know about the side effects of taking the drugs that she uh she takes maybe it is possible to hallucinate a fridge trying to eat you who knows uh, but that is her story, and obviously there is a second story containing the three characters. Uh, I t- tell me you didn't laugh at this particular storyline, Michael. Uh, uh, I, 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 I laughed. <laughs> I laughed. I laughed. Okay, there is a the thing. The first time I watched this, there was one scene related to that storyline where I laughed so hard that I thought I was going to have a heart attack. Oh my god! I was, uh, and it was like. You know, I was actually, this was going to be, I was going to have a great build up into this where I was going to say that, um, I think I, if it's the know, scene I'm thinking of, then oh my God. I, I'm wondering, but okay. Basically, um, um the, th- the thing is, okay. So, uh, I, I was going to say like, for me, this film, it didn't, it didn't feel very authentic as like an experience of like a descent into anxiety as somebody who, uh, and I don't think I've ever, maybe I meant, I feel like I have mentioned this on the podcast, but I have a, a, a mild anxiety disorder. It's getting better and better, but I've had like panic attacks and stuff. And I do think, I'll say this, just in the midst of nowhere, that Iron Man 3 does a pretty accurate job at representing what it, what it would really be like. like and maybe this is more extreme, wow. but. And Iron Man 3 shout out, wow. But, uh, I will say that like, I, I did, I did relate to the, the anxiety credits felt because when I, when I laughed so hard at the scene that I thought I was going to have, have a heart attack, I, I felt, to be honest, a bit anxious. You know, I was, and it was, <laughs> It was the scene of the guy saying, <laughs> it's like, so, and here's the thing, it, it's the, the final kind of montage of everything going to shit for oh everyone. Oh my god, it is, and, it is that scene I'm thinking and, of. It and is. the guy says, ass to ass. <laughs> that was what I was thinking. That's what and, I was thinking. And I, I laughed, and then he says, like, like this, <laughs> he says, mashed potatoes. <laughs> Oh it's like it's just the way he said it. Literally, like afterwards, I had to <laughs> on YouTube. I just looked up as as I was watching it on repeat. Yes, <laughs> yes. The thing is, in isolation, it's funny, and I can picture him saying it, and I can't. I, I can it see, I, I can see you laughing, and I can't yeah. get it out of my head how ridiculous it is. But while it's it, it's I, in the middle of all those scenes, it, I know I, I it's laugh. it's. I, I know, I get you. Like that's the thing. I, I feel like it is the the big problem at the center of the film is just I didn't really, I I couldn't relate to the characters, and like because it was just like. There was, there was no moment. I think it's, you know, I think it, in a way it's, uh, Darren Aronofsky's artsiness. And sorry, I feel like I'm setting something up, which I'm not actually setting up, but his, his artsiness kind of is his own, um, Achilles heel in a way because he, he has to have everything feel so cinematic. You can't really relate to the characters because they don't feel like real people because they just feel like things in this big cinematic, uh, expert. Like I was thinking about the fact that he, he's often, and this is why I'm quite reluctant to watch Mother. Because he, he often does have it. He doesn't have it really in, well, actually he does, okay. Very unpleasant imagery. And obviously in this, but the one in this one would be the guy who's like his, his got the horrible bleeding scabby whatever. Um, in, yeah. in Black Swan, someone's toenail gets like ripped in half. And apparently a mother that's like loads of horrible stuff. And for me, I was thinking oh, yeah, about yeah. it. I was thinking about it and I was realizing like, I don't like when that happens in a film because it takes me out of the film because it's like, it's so not pleasant to watch that my immediate response is the kind of, disassociate from the film and just think like, oh, and like, I, and it's kind of like, there's a part of my brain just says, well, it's not real because obviously like almost as a response. So maybe, maybe I guess I'll humanize myself a bit when I see very unpleasant imagery. And I'm not going to lie. Like there's other things I found goofy. Like I'm not going to say it's all about the unpleasant imagery, but particularly like when I saw that like unpleasant imagery, and I was like, oh, like I feel like at that moment, part of my brain said, it's just a film. Don't really worry about it. Don't really think about it. It's just, you know, 
a gross little special effect. And I feel like that's that's one thing which maybe kind of already had triggered that. And that was obviously quite close to everything going completely mental. So already I had that thought in my head of like, oh, it's, you know, I already had that disassociation from that unpleasant imagery. And then suddenly we get like, <laughs> so so when it gets to the old S to S, I'm, I'm just gone, like at that point. And yeah, I feel like basically that's the thing with this film. It, it's kind of like, it's a bit like a, if you're with a, a, a guy who's trying to do, I don't know why I said guy, that's weird. Well, it's like, it says a lot, but that's very Freudian. If you're with somebody in a, in a sexual encounter and they start trying to do role play, you know, if they, uh, if they really kind of draw you in, you're going to be like, oh yeah, okay, this is great. But what if they like fart, you know, then suddenly you're not really into it anymore. And then if they continue the role play, then it's just going to get worse and worse and worse. That's my equivalent to this film. This film is a, a film. It's, it's trying to have sex with you uh, and it's trying to do some role play, but then it, it has a little fart. And, and then at that point, you're like, I can't really take this seriously. But then it keeps doing the role play and it's like, oh, you know, you've been a naughty boy. You need to get uh, punished. And you're like, I can't take this seriously anymore because you just farted. That's how I feel about this film. This sounds very specific. This, <laughs> that's, uh, this metaphor. It's a very deep personal uh, experience for me. Yeah, but okay. So I guess you have an idea from that because. Yeah, I mean, I, I get it. Like, that's the thing. I can completely understand how if, if, if you don't have that slight, it, it's cumulative. I think that's the issue. Like, if you don't have that slight little jolt, that, that suspends your or fails to suspend your disbelief. Then obviously, yeah. if you go into that like completely, like oh yeah, okay, I, I relate to these characters. I, then then all of that I stuff think is going to be a case of, Here's the thing: I okay. don't have any. I don't relate. <coughs> sorry, I don't relate to the characters. I think they're really weird. Okay. Obviously, like then they're, they're nothing like me. But I can appreciate how people are like that, and I can appreciate you know falling uh, somebody falling into the situation. I see. Yeah. Do. So it's more and like a are, sympathy rather than empathy, you might say. Well, I guess so. And I, oh, there are a couple of moments like the fridge opening up where I thought, oh, that's quite shit. And yes, the ass to ass thing, that was in my mind because it's just how he says it is so ridiculous. It's like, oh, wow. I'm going to watch that after this review again. <laughs> well, that's the thing. Like, ass to ass. Overall, I'm not out of yeah. it. Like, I am engaged in it. Uh, and my criticisms of the movie aren't actually to do with this. It's more to do with the yeah. themes. But the actual way it's portrayed and the stories, I I mean, I don't find them unbelievable because maybe, I don't know, I've just read a lot of stuff, so I know shit like this can happen. Um, I mean, maybe, I don't know, maybe that's the, the difference. Like, I'm not really surprised at anything. I'm not really surprised at anything at all that really that happens in life. I rarely, I don't know. Yeah, you are I pretty really jaded. I know, I am. I rarely see a story and think, oh my God, I can't believe that happened. Like, er everything just brushes past me. Um, yeah. So when you heard about Jeffrey this, Epstein, you were just like, well, duh. Yeah, literally, the morning he, I was in uh, Washington, D.C., the morning that he died, or he, he you know, was uh, was a executed by Hillary Clinton. <laughs> and, uh, no, no, he killed me next. I don't want to, everyone have to find a new co host. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he, uh, yeah, he died, and I was like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. And I, I was, I wasn't like, oh my god, I can't believe, when was the last time I sat up? I was probably when Kirby Bryant died, actually. That was probably it. Last time you were, uh, like, really, uh, bothered. Really shocked. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, true. yeah. That's when I was shocked. But with this, I was like, yeah, I can imagine this happening. And again, I'm not a doctor. Maybe it is unrealistic, but I can I can imagine all of this happening. And obviously, the stories with the three other characters about how Jared Leto gets gangrene. And I mean, I'm sure that has happened. Before. Yeah, it must have. And but I feel like nowadays they're better at dealing with gangrene. You know, they don't have the old yeah. sore bones anymore. And uh, obviously, Tyrone, uh, the black character, how he gets arrested and put in jail. Uh, obviously, that's <laughs> that know, never happens. Ha happened. Like. <laughs> and then. Oh, yeah. um, uh, Marion, who is forced to go into prostitution uh, or prostitutes herself uh, because of um, her drug addiction. Obviously, that's something that's realistic as well. So, yeah, um, and again, I knowing about the opioid crisis and how it has affected Americans, that, again, wouldn't be in the, you know, you wouldn't particularly associate with becoming uh, drug addicted, uh, older Americans. Uh, I can imagine how um, someone like uh, Sarah, uh, Sarah Goldfarb got addicted to uh, the drug she was on, and uh, yeah, ultimately lost her mind. That is that is believable as well. And yes, there are a couple of moments where it's like, oh, I don't know about that. That's a bit shit, isn't it? You know. But overall, I can, I get uh, the stories. I can see it happening. So yeah, I am not. I, I'm guess I'm not out of it like you. Yeah, I, I, I think part of it for me is, and I know I'm kind of repeated like several different examples of like ways it's it's like to me. But I feel like it's kind of it's a very high stakes thing where. Because it's, and obviously this is just the way I personally read films, but like, for me, if like a film's gonna have a really serious message, then especially a serious message where the whole point of the film is kind of just the message, uh, it's kind of, it, it has to pretty much nail it, which is obviously quite a high standard, but you know, uh, basically other films, like obviously, you know, 
suffice it to say, I mean, it wouldn't surprise you to know that a, a fantasy action and adventure film can have all sorts of stupid moments in it, and I, I won't have an issue. But if it's like a kind of very serious uh, drama about like drug abuse and stuff, and then it has stupid moments in it, I, I think for me that just yeah, that that's that's it. Like basically, if it was a less serious topic, a less kind of serious genre. Uh, then I'd be like, oh yeah, it's a stupid moment, whatever. But I find it harder to dismiss in like films that are like, yeah, look at this. Oh, it's an arts film about drugs. But yeah, okay. I, I get where you're coming from. Where like, obviously, if you can, yeah, yeah compartmentalize say, it, as the kids say. Those are uh, moments which, well, they're anomalies. Basically, that's what I would yeah. say to that. So they don't really bother me. But anyway, we'll get on. To, well, actually, one more thing about the plot which I did like. Um, obviously, this movie is about addiction and particularly drug addiction. And I really did like how uh, Darren Aronofsky uses the seasons to communicate, uh, or, or to just a parallel uh, drug addiction. How you know you get that initial high, and everything's going well, and then you know things go badly, and then you're at rock bottom. I guess is the, is the phrase that is used. And it, it's the same with uh, summer. You know when everything's good, yep. and then fall is when there, there is a fall, which I do like. Yeah, and then winter the, much better than autumn. Every, yeah, exactly. I don't. I don't think I've ever seen that before. Like a fall is when I, when the characters fall. Of yeah, course, it doesn't work for it, us, like you say, because autumn is uh, what we call fall, so we wouldn't think like that. But yeah, and then winter obviously is when you know you're at the lowest, and you see, uh, yeah, you see everything go extremely badly, and characters are at their uh, rock bottom. Uh, I, I I I use that that phrase rock bottom. I don't really like using because apparently uh, I, I listened to a podcast once that uh, criticised the phrase rock bottom. Um, and it was related related to drug addiction and people getting back on their feet or something. I can't remember exactly why, but well, yeah, they had, they had a go at that. Is it because of yeah. like crack rock? Yeah, it's like, no, 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 no. Crack it's not, nothing to do. Oh, okay. with, it's nothing to do with that. It's nothing to do with that. Uh, I can't. Yeah, I can't remember. But anyway, it's beside the point. Basically, yeah, I did like how Darren Ar- Aronofsky did that. I thought that was that was quite smart and did parallel with how uh, addiction does work. As well. Yeah, yeah. I can think of like there are films obviously do take place very, sort of, you know directly over the course of a year um but yeah I, I can't yeah i can't think of a film that parallels i i think i feel like there is one i feel like there's actually and this is there's like a romance film possibly blue valentine which i haven't actually seen in ages but it stars like ryan gosling um where um where a similar thing happens where it's like but instead it's like the romance so it's kind of like i think it starts off in spring and the romance kind of springs up and then in summer the romance is like really warm and lovely and then in fall they start to fall out and then by winter they're unhappy and miserable and they end up breaking up so there is that film which I should say came after this film so obviously Dovsky is fine but yeah so I, uh, I, I was thinking I have seen another film and I think that's it okay I guess that's the plot but obviously as you said this movie is basically all about the message because mm. I mean there's not really a lot of, the only plot moment that it's, it's that really switches it uh, the story is when uh, Tyrone gets arrested after the guy he's with gets shot in the car. That's when it all yeah, goes down. Yeah, that, that's the funny thing actually that struck out, uh, stuck out to me about it. The fact that Tyrone is like, he feels like he's the one where there's kind of a plot trying to happen around him. And this isn't a criticism, but like I was thinking that, it kind of feels like, because obviously he's got like this this gangster thing. Oh, it's going to be Clockers, um, that Spike Lee film or something that, no, uh, which is fine. But yeah, basically it's like, it's as if like there's this little gangster film happening in the background. You only see glimpses of it for our man Tyrone. Here's a thought, Luke. Have you noticed how themes and the message start with the same six letters? Yes, let's talk about the message. So what is Requiem for a Dream about, Michael? That is the question. Well, I have a quote from uh, Darren Aronofsky. What is it about so we don't have to worry anymore? Uh, He says, Requiem for a Dream is not about heroin or drugs. Uh, The Harry Tyrone Marion story is a very traditional heroin story, but putting it side by side with the Sarah story, or Sarah, uh, we suddenly say... Oh my god, what is a drug? The idea that the same inner monologue goes through a person's head when they're trying to quit drugs, as with cigarettes, as when they're trying to, to not eat food so they can lose 20 pounds, was really fascinating to me. I thought it was an idea that we hadn't seen on film, and I wanted to bring it up on the screen. Uh, so yeah, what, what do you have to say about the uh, the message or the themes of this movie, Michael? So with um, Sarah, I was for me, I was thinking, oh yeah, Big Pharma, that's like, a, you know, they, they like to push their own drugs, you know, that's what... Um, I mean, to be fair, I've heard, like, comedians say that, you know, like, I'm pretty sure Bill Hicks and, like, George Carlin and these other edgy people who are now dead, suspiciously, um, like, to say, they're like, oh, yeah, the government doesn't want you buying uh, your drugs, they want you buying their drugs, you know, their drugs, are, well, the big farmer is pushing all that stuff, whatever. So, yeah, that, that's what I was ma- main thing about, so, but obviously, yeah, there is that aspect of anything can become an addiction, um, uh, and I definitely think that's that's true, and to that point, and anything can kind of be a drug, um, and obviously, I mean, what is... What is a drug really, Luke? I, I would say, or what is an addiction? I would say an addiction is something where 
anything that has immediate gratification but long-term negative consequences. For me, that's what kind of defines an addiction, you know. And in that's- and you have to and you have to do it day after day. Yeah. Um, yeah. Basically. And I mean, you know, maybe obviously I would say you could still, it could be a situation of like, oh, you, you kind of, you kick it for a little bit and then you relapse. That's obviously a thing that would happen with, with different drugs. Um, and overall, yeah, I think definitely that's true. And honestly, I will say the only kind of weird thing about that to me, and this is my problem, slight problem that I'll say with, with the kind of perfection of that theme, because I, I don't think the theme is necessarily perfect in this, is that you basically got three characters who it is all about drugs. Uh, one of the characters, the Marion, um, then goes into kind of sex, but that, you know, I don't think that's explored from that kind of standpoint, which is weird because it very obviously could have been. Like, there's so many ways that you can say sex can be an addiction because sex obviously, you know, does it have immediate gratification? Yes. Can it have negative effects? Well, sure. If it like, you know, affects your attitude towards other human beings or. Well, it wasn't, I don't think he's saying like sex is. Bad. No, no, yeah, sorry. But I guess what I'm saying yeah. is he could have, um, he could have turned a critical lens to that aspect of Marin's character in a way where I kind of feel like he didn't because I feel like basically it seems to me like as much as they're like oh it's um about what can be a drug three of the characters three out of four of his characters very directly everything bad about their lives is related to drugs so you know it's kind of weird to me that he'd say that's what he wanted to explore because my, my reading of it was oh and obviously big pharma so it's like drugs 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 oh and big pharma doctors can kind of give you drugs as well and that's bad <laughs> yeah. rather than oh loads of things can be drugs because loads of things can be drugs well three out of your four characters are addicted to drugs primarily and the, the fourth character is also addicted to drugs but just in a slightly different way so i don't know you're an idiot no, yeah it's fine <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay so yeah i think obviously he says it's about addiction but yeah three out of the four they are addicted to heroin so you know if you wanted to mix it up a bit maybe don't have three out of four addicted to heroin that would be yeah you know people idea. can be addicted to video games yeah, they could, they can. Although video games obviously don't have the same issues that heroin does. It's true. Um, yeah, you, yeah. I mean, his his. <laughs> like, uh, oh no, you've been playing your games too much that you've worn down your thumb and it's got infected. We're gonna have to cut off your arm. <laughs> okay. No. So yeah, that the Harry Tower Marion story is just oh people. It, it is a basic story, uh, which yeah. is why it's not that interesting. I I found in terms of themes, I found the Sarah. Uh, golf art yeah. um, theme more interesting because there's obviously the scene where uh, she's talking to uh, Jared Leto, uh, who of course is her son, and she's just explaining how she's just got so, you know, she her life is just empty essentially. Yeah, and you know she just wants to feel something, anything, you know, a reason to get up in the morning, and I I think millions of Americans do feel like that unfortunately. And th- th- that is something that uh, obviously she becomes a- <clears throat> addicted. Uh, to, well, I guess, yeah, those, those drugs because she wants, she just wants meaning. She just wants something, you know, to happen, uh, in her life. And you could say, well, you know, that's maybe the case with Harry and Tyron and Marion, but there isn't a real reason why they yeah, are yeah. addicted to Harry. Yeah, they don't really so kind think, of explore the psychology behind it for the, the other three, whereas obviously it does get more exploration with yeah. her. Uh, yeah. And I, but I do, what I do like about the theme, I'll, I'll say this is a positive, is that, he is kind of saying how, you know, anyone from any background, uh, they can get addicted to drugs. I mean, you have like, the, I think it's a complete set here of, you know, young male, young female, one's from a rich background, one's from a poor background, you know, African American male and an older, uh, woman. And this problem of addiction affects all sections of society, um, which obviously is, uh, something that, you know, he could have just done it about, like, I guess Harry and Marion. Or, or even Tyrone, who's like, oh yeah, these are the stereotypical people who are affected by drug addiction. But yeah, it's also, uh, th- this kind of addiction also affects people uh, like his mom. Mm, it's like uh, uh, Desperate Housewives, where Lynette gets addicted to um, her kid's ADHD medication because it helps her do more as a mom. And she's like, I need it. It helps me be a better mom. Why have you watched this? Uh, I've watched uh, Desperate Housewives all the time. It's called uh, Not Being Affected by Toxic Masculinity. Let me tell you, okay, this poor young guy, he's got a plan to ruin the whole neighborhood and everyone's so angry at him. It is it is just great. Um, also, Susan started being a cam whore, which is relevant to... That's what they could... Uh, see, I guess it's, it was too old. You know, cam whores weren't a thing back then. Um, anyway, I agree with you, basically, Luke. Um, I think that it is. It's, it's, the, it's the more interesting message and it's the one which definitely gets uh, more exploration and... Well, I get, or rather, there's more to explore, simply. And yes. the, yeah, I think, um, overall, it's, it's, if you're just looking at it from kind of trying to glean the message, it is 
wears the most there. And to be honest, with the the other three, I would kind of struggle to get a message beyond drugs are bad. Whereas obviously it's it's mm-hmm. yeah, exactly. me, Mary, yeah. and I was getting confused. Obviously it's Sarah who is the complicating factor to that. Who who you might say problematizes the uh, the question by introducing this idea. Of, oh, but there's you know other things that can be drugs too. And you go, okay, yeah, sure, got you. Um, yeah, I mean, why why does Harry want to get involved in drugs and Tyrone want to want to get involved in drugs? It's to make money, which is not you know that interesting, is it? And why does Marion want to get involved in drugs? Uh, well, I mean, they didn't really explore her character that well at all. It is, well, she's run away from her yeah. parents, essentially. And so she likes drugs now. Yeah, again. in a way, actually, it's, I will say this. Um, I think, because I said how I didn't really relate to any of the characters and kind of struggled to see them as real people. I think part of it is that they're too isolated from their surrounding circumstances. Because I think it would have done a lot for me in this film if you would have seen Marion's home life. And you would have kind of seen, like, their their situation with other people around them, like how they interacted with different other people who are like normal, because it would kind of help to contextualize the whole thing and contextualize their situation. Like if you saw Marion's parents, you could be like, okay, so that's where she's coming from, blah, 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 blah. So I will say that's just a little extra thing. I think they kind of would have had those other people around them to kind of get home where they're coming and what makes them different. Because in, in a way, I think one of the problems is when you have a film that's just about people who all have this addictive mindset, it almost feels like, it's not really a choice because it's like, oh, they live in this world where apparently everyone's addicted to drugs all the time. Maybe that's maybe yes. weird, but yeah. Yeah, no, I, I can kind of understand that. But th- this is the problem with uh, the movie, I, I guess, because three out of four characters, it does just seem like, oh, drugs are bad. Yeah. Uh, or addiction is bad. That's, there's more to the Sarah Goldfarb story as we've gone into, but out of three out of four, it's just like, oh, addiction is really bad. And that that is it. And there isn't more to it than that. And yeah. That that is it. That is an issue where I have with the theme, because mm. um, I was expecting maybe it would dive into the, I guess the lack of opportunity that some of the characters faced, and the uh, the lack of a cohesive and functioning society that means that yeah. people like Harry and Tyrone are drawn into uh, the world of drugs, and you know the drug addictions come from there. But that that isn't explored at all. It's just like oh, drugs are an addiction. It's really bad, guys. It's really bad. Yeah, and I'm kind of like well. Yeah, obviously. Like we, yeah, obviously. Like you can have someone like Marion who's uh, prostituting herself, and you, you can have like uh, infections, or you can end up in jail. It's like, yeah, th- this is, yeah, this is what happens. And so, and obviously, I, I said in when I'm talking about the plot, it's like, yeah, that stuff can happen. So that's why I believe it. It's believable. Um, but the actual message is, well, yeah, oh, like obviously that this can happen. And I don't. This kind of movie, I didn't just want it to be. Yeah. Oh, aren't, isn't drugs and addiction really bad? Like a more artsy version, I guess, of a Reef of Madness, you know? Yes. I didn't just want it to be like that. And sadly, that's why I think the theme, well, the themes weren't that great because it yeah. just kind of was at the end. I mean, you think of the ending, just to talk about the the end, obviously, there's four intercut scenes of Marion um, humiliating herself and then there's uh, Tyrone in jail um, What's the face gets electroshock Harry. therapy, which is fun. Yeah, electro electroshock therapy, and Harry is getting his arm amputated because he's got gangrene on it, and it is just absolutely shoving it in your face that oh, this yeah like, drug addiction is really bad, guys. So it's like yes, I, I get it. Like this scene of insc- scene of insc- scene, and yes, I I understand. I I know it's it's bad. Yeah, you, you it kind of feels almost me. weirdly like very contrary to what you could say about the film. So I've gone to it always feels like kind of kiddie in a way to be like, look at these four people, and today we're going to see what drugs do to their lives. You know, like that kind of like exactly. Setup, you're like, yes, it's like, like, that's that, why like I... the next the next one he's done is like, uh, look at how uh, having bad manners affects these these people. You know, like just yeah. like stuff for kids and. And that's the thing, like, that these things can happen to people who do drugs, but you're really trying to ram it uh, down people's throats, uh, if you will, and I, I don't think that's the best thing when talking about, you know, how to display a message. And that it is why I said, like, I referred it to kind of like Reef of Madness. Yeah. Because it is, obviously, Reef of Madness it was... It's a, a song by Hawkwind. In the 50s, yes, and that that design was, was made to keep, you know, kids away from weed. And this movie, I, I remember... Uh, I, I read a Roger Ebert review the first time I 
watch this movie and he said at the end well this you know if any kid sees this movie then they definitely will stay away from drugs it's true and, <laughs> that. and that's yeah and that's the thing it's like okay yes that is, that is true and drugs can lead to serious negative consequences like this but is that all the theme is just like drugs are bad yeah because i mean i'd i'd hope i'd hope for more is all no yeah basically yeah i i, I think obviously that's it and i was thinking recently actually about um arrival mostly because i was subject to a very frustrating um, clip of somebody saying they didn't like uh, Arrival and they didn't, they literally didn't mention any of like the themes in terms of language and communication and how like, uh, that can affect our attitude and our mentality and like that. Literally the whole thing was just then talking about like plot holes and refusing to engage with the film on any thematic level. And it was really triggering me. And I just started thinking about how much I like just everything that Arrival has to say about the way we view the world and the way that kind of how we conceptualize concepts impacts the way that we act in the world. And it's just like on so many different levels that Arrival deals with it. And then you look at a film like this and it's just like, oh, do you want to know how drugs impact the way we deal with the world? It's, it's bad. It'd be like, you know, it'd basically be yeah. like if, if Arrival was just like the whole film was some guy who wasn't speaking clearly and that was it. And I was like, oh man, this is annoying. This guy's not yeah. speaking clearly. So yeah. Oh, yeah. This is, it is kind of like this movie, Darren Ar- well, obviously he didn't, you know, uh, come up with the idea that it was already a novel. But anyway, the, the let's just take the movie on its own because I don't know how it differs from the novel. It is this movie is just like let's get the worst case scenario of four characters who take drugs that are you know uh, all uh, live in the same area, oh, and let's just see how low we can sink them. How, how low can, we can you get. go? Yeah, it is that. How low can you go? Uh, the movie, and again, if you're if you want to go into well, how did they get here? Uh, yeah. Obviously, with Sarah is explained, uh, but with you know Harry and Tyrone and Marion, it ain't explained about you know how again a yeah. maybe a society that you know leads people down this path isn't that good. Yeah, like actually, there was, there was uh, one scene of um, that, there's, there's one scene of her looking at like, and obviously she even explicitly mentions it, but Harry's graduation. And I was thinking, like, mm-hmm. see, see, that's interesting to me because, like, you know, how did he go from? And I guess it was graduation from high school, probably not, you know, high yeah, education. Yeah, it was. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, but yeah. you know, like. The, the fact that kind of they introduced this idea of, oh yeah, he's, he's graduating from high school, you know, and obviously, you know, I, I realize that failing to graduate from high school is pretty bad, but they introduced this idea of, look at this kind of thing that he's in some sense achieved of, of kind of graduating from high school. There he is in this fancy little yeah. thing in indicating his hopes for the future as somebody. And yet they never, you know, address the obvious question, which is, well, how do you get from one place to the other? Somebody who's, you know, bright, leaving school, ready, the world's your oyster, blah, 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 to taking drugs. And it's just kind of unaddressed how he gets from one place to the other. And it's bad. Yeah. So yeah, I guess overall, yeah, uh, it's this movie or the themes of the message is just how awful addiction can get, how awful it can be. And, you know, if that's all that, that this movie wants to do, then fine, I, I guess, you know, it was, if that's what Aronofsky, Darren Aronofsky set out to do, then okay, fair play. But I would like, you know, if they explored how some characters got into those positions. But if that's not what the movie is about, then fair enough. But I can't rate it as high as I otherwise would have. And that is the most important thing to people like Darren Aronofsky. Uh, I am sure. Uh, so anyway, Michael, true. let's get in. Yes, absolutely true. Let's get into the visual techniques used in this movie because, of course, it's uh, it's quite uh, it stands out quite a bit. Yeah, it's quite Darren, it's, it's quite iconic. Movie. I would say the um, oh, it definitely a lot is. of the, yeah. the visuals in this film. And I think that's it is an interesting thing. Like I had somebody um talking about actually they were talking about Gone with the Wind, which is funny enough. But they were saying like one of the things I like to think about some review of this was when I'm thinking about how how a film holds up is how how many visuals. Can I remember from, from the film? And obviously their, their argument was that in Gone with the Wind, you know, you watch this four hour film and at the end of it, you can't really remember that much from it. And obviously, I guess if that person were to watch this film, they'd probably come out saying it's a 10 out of 10 because there's a lot of things that stick in your mind in terms of images and then visuals and, uh, kind of editing techniques and that sort of stuff, such as. Now you're going to just start listing them all off. I, th- I sorry. I thought you were going to say something. Uh, yeah. Well, such as one of the things that is used is split screenshots. Yes. Uh, which uh, is it happens quite a bit at the beginning of the movie, and then it tails off. doesn't really happen that much after, does it? Mm. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, in that case, I don't really know what it means, and I don't think it means anything. I think it's just there arbitrarily, which is fine. He's allowed to do that, but obviously, that's what it is. And yeah, this doesn't seem to have any purpose. Thing as it's just like well, yeah, you because know, there is a context in which you could use it. You could use it to communicate things of isolation or people being apart and stuff like well, that. That's but, what it is when it uses, isn't it? Like how they're actually isolated. But then obviously that doesn't Even really make sense together. because it's used at the beginning when their drug addictions are less severe. Well, whereas, it shows that the relationship is fake, I guess. Yeah, good, good one. That, that's some, yeah. I mean, that's <laughs> that's what I can think. You know, they they are together, but they're not really together, are they? And obviously, 
that that is what happens at the end of the movie. They're not really together, and it's because of the drugs that they take that you know separates them. Um, one of the other visual techniques, Michael, is the use of rapid cuts or a hip hop montage. Yes. Uh, whenever the characters use street drugs, a rapid su- succession of images illustrates their transition from sobriety to yes. intoxication. That that uh, is the big uh, one. It is the big one. Uh, an average one hundred minute film has about six hundred to seven hundred cuts. Uh, how many cuts does Requiem for a Dream have, Michael? Can you tell me? Uh, I kind of want to guess just twice as many. So, like, I guess fourteen hundred. Two thousand. That's all, that's Almost. basically three times as many. Seventy six hundred, yeah. seven hundred. Three times. Yep, three times as much. So, yeah, a lot of cuts in this movie, and obviously that's used to you know illustrate uh, how yeah. uh, you know being on drugs can be. Um, but also, Michael, there are other. Well, you, actually, do you want to talk about that a bit? Um, no, yeah. I mean, I think because I kind of already covered how, like, it's noted. I mentioned The Simpsons. Yeah. It's it's parodied. It's kind of really famous. But ultimately, it's it's kind of a situation where you can't really be like, oh yeah, it's it's really good. It's sort of just. I, I think it's kind of just. It's so associated with this film that it, it's just there mm-hmm. and it's what it is. Yeah, it's unique and it did bring something into pop culture. So fair play, but yeah, uh, it's not that amazing, I guess. Um, there's also shots where the camera is strapped to an actor and facing them. Yes, and yes, you do see that, yeah. Yeah, that's, again, that's something that ties into what I wanted to talk to next, which I do really like in these sort of psychological um, movies where um, the character's face is r- literally right next to the camera all the time. Uh, a lot of yeah. close-up shots. Oh, you'd love Lord of the Rings. <laughs> yes, uh, and that's the thing. It's I, I do like it. This is maybe why I you know, was more invested in the stories of these characters and wasn't like, oh, this isn't believable. Because you can really... Because I think the actors give a good performance, all of them particularly. You feel like you're up in their face. Uh, yeah, well, you're, you're almost... You can see their their mind almost, can't you, Michael? Well, maybe you can. I can see it because, through their pupils. Yeah, well, yeah, you can you can really get into what they're... Uh, uh, what they're thinking, what they're feeling. At least at least I could. And, the, yeah, the extreme close-ups... Uh, I think are, are really good, and I like them. Yeah, no, yeah. So, I mean, um, yeah. the Coen Brothers use extreme close-ups a lot to make you feel uncomfortable. So, yeah, no, but it's a really good technique. Yeah, it's a good technique. Yeah. Let's do it, Luke. That's what we should do for our podcast, to make people feel uncomfortable, just have like really close-up shots of our face saying everything. <laughs> Brilliant. Yes. No, yeah, It's. I guess it is It is quite simple, but it, no, yeah. when the actors are doing a good job, it works really well. Uh, so anything else to say, Michael? Um, no, yeah. I mean, basically, the film does have a lot... Uh, and yeah, a lot going on. But ult- and ultimately, yes, it is. It's definitely kind of fancy. But I would always, well, usually say there are some exceptions. But I would say, except in exceptional circumstances, the quality of the visuals has to be in service of something bigger. And in this case, it's not necessarily as much. And to be honest, yeah, I say exceptional. Like I was thinking yeah, about like um, kind of in service. Kind. I, of. I was thinking about like um, Wes Anderson. I was like, oh yeah, Wes Anderson. You know, it's it, it's just a bit, that's not even true. Like Wes Anderson is really good kind of characters, and they're often really funny. So yeah, I don't know. Basically, I would say that um, it's not worth watching this film just for how it looks. Uh, and I, you know, in terms of the themes, I think it's stuff lacking and things like that. But ultimately, yeah, the visuals in and of themselves are good. I think this movie has aged rather well. Here's the thing: uh, drug movies around this time, so late 90s, early 2000s, uh, were quite popular. They were all the rage. And why was this, Michael? Because of Nirvana. Uh, I mean, kind of. Well, maybe it's because of Nirvana, but I was going to uh, say it's because of another movie, uh, Train Spotting. Yes. Uh, which came out in 1996, obviously launched the careers of Ewan McGregor and Danny Boyle, and uh, is you know quite famous, obviously, and it's about drugs. And uh, There's also movies that came out around this time, uh, like Spun, which is a 2002 American black comedy drama film about drugs, and there's Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas, which came out in 1998, and uh, there's also The Basketball Diaries. How could we forget that? Which came out in 1995, which stars uh, Leonardo DiCaprio. Uh, again, about drugs, uh, and so yeah, all these drug movies around this time, and possibly because of Nirvana. Maybe uh, I don't. I wasn't live in the nineties, so I don't know if Nirvana. I feel like it was kind of more to do with that whole Generation X cynical thing that people had going on back then. I was just like, yeah, perhaps. oh man, everything sucks. I'm gonna shoot myself. You know, everyone loves that. Yeah, every everyone does love that. Uh, yes, and maybe that that is why. And so, drugs movies about drugs, which were naturally, uh, you know, about how depressing taking drugs can be. And how uh, awful it can be. Yeah, maybe that's why it was popular. Uh, but I guess the reason, well, the point I want to make here is that I think nowadays 
with how drugs are used in America, uh, this movie, I, th- I don't know if it's aged well, maybe that's not the phrase, but it's more relevant yeah. um, today. Because he- here's the thing, obviously drug movies back 20 years ago, like I said, were quite popular. But movies like this are just not made anymore like, like this. And uh, it's just a depiction of how awful things can be. For well, it's because things American, are so much better now. Yeah, exactly. For an American underclass who things have got worse in the last 20 years. And with coronavirus, obviously, there's a whole new thing, which we will see how that ends up uh, for America. But yeah, probably probably not great. And I, I think of this, this movie that came out a couple of years ago called The Florida Project, yes. which kind of dealt with this. It wasn't necessarily about drugs. but Drugs were involved, of course. And... Yeah, I, I, I do think that these kind of movies are more relevant now because of the, we've mentioned it before, the opioid cr- uh, crisis, which has claimed the lives of so many Americans. And uh, it has claimed the lives of so many Americans, I believe the opioid crisis is the cause of this, that amazingly in America, I don't know if you know this, Michael, but life expectancy has been decreasing for the last three years. Okay, see, so yeah, I, I, uh, I know that they've got a pretty rubbish life expectancy. Like, I think infant mortality or something is increasing now too. Something yeah, that like would... That. That won't be surprising, but uh, the reason why life expectancy decreasing is so incredible uh, for the last three years is because uh, America, well, this has never happened before in any developed country's history, that uh, where they haven't been in a war. Obviously, yeah. World War Two, World War One. obviously, life expectancy decreases because a lot of people are fighting, but America isn't in a world war anymore. It's not even in a, well, it's not in Vietnam. Right. Obviously, a lot more, more American troops are sent there. They're still in Iraq and Afghanistan. But, you know, there's not that many there, so you can't really say it's a, yeah. a proper war. Uh, but amazingly, life expectancy in America is still decreasing. And I think you can look at that and, you know, their coronavirus response, which we were talking about before. We start talking about Reckoning for a Dream and say, yeah, it is, it is a failed state for sure, America. Um, and the opioid crisis illustrates why. Mm. And I bet that, Rome's, you, I bet Rome's life expectancy was decreasing towards the end too. So yeah, it's well, going to be a good comparison. Mm, yes. And, I think there is, there has to be, and like I said, the Flora Project kind of touched on it, but there has to be another movie that comes out like this that talks about, you know, the societal reasons why stuff like the opioid crisis happens, why drug addiction happens, because that it's this issue has not gone away. It has increased. Um, and, you know, I obviously there's been a lot of talk in politics over the last few years uh, about, I guess, racism because of Donald Trump. Uh, in America, at least, and kind of in here as well. Uh, that's the major thing that people like to talk about in, in terms of politics. But like, I remember before Trump got elected that the opioid crisis was getting a lot of attention, and it still hasn't gone away. Um, and I, you read some stories on the internet of people because it really affects uh, places like Kentucky and West Virginia, North Carolina, kind of the Appalachian region of America. Do you know what I'm talking yeah, about? Yeah, 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 hillbilly country. <laughs> yes, uh, that's the uh, technical term, I believe. And yeah, you just read some stories from people who were just like whole towns were just, you know, on fucking uh, opioids and it was just awful. And uh, I remember reading one story about this person who was, you know, visiting a strip club in Kentucky. It was like in 2005. I can't remember which, which uh, social media platform I read it on, but it's undoubtedly true because it was on a social media platform. Yeah. And they were talking about how. You know, there was this girl who was underage, who was stripping, and she was doing it for opioids. And this is, he was saying this was back in 2005 in Kentucky, and he can't imagine how bad the situation is now because it's because it's only gotten worse since then. But it was he's saying it's really fucked in the mid 2000s when nobody was talking about it. Um, and yeah, I just think really like there is a, a room for another movie like this, but it has to it has to go beyond isn't drug addiction bad? It has to yeah. be like I said before. Um, complex because yeah because in this movie it's, there's well it's no further point beyond addiction is awful and ruins people's lives it's got to be well why does addiction happen in the first place and if there's ever a time for a movie to come out like that it is right now so I guess yeah the relevance of this movie has not diminished um, and yeah basically another one should be made of it just like a American Psycho another American Psycho should be remade yeah. and redone same with this movie keep making films until we solve the problems that's the solution Yes, obviously art and these movies aren't going to solve the problem, but uh, yeah, I think... Art imitates life. Art does imitate life, and uh, yeah, I I mean, it can't hurt to bring awareness to a cause uh, like this, Uh, and I guess uh, probably nothing will happen, because, you know, nobody cares anymore about anything, but you know what, let's give it a go anyway, let's make another 
uh, Requiem for a Dream, uh, based in Kentucky. Uh, that is what I'm going for, Michael. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's got to be like some films based in Kentucky that are, you know, deal with that kind of thing. I mean, why not? Maybe we just don't see it because you know who cares about Kentucky? What about? I mean, that's that is the issue. Who cares about Kentucky? Uh, yeah, that's the like, problem. That yeah. is, that, that is the problem. I mean, you, you're kind of saying it half jokingly, but nobody does care about Kentucky. Yeah, so basically, why we need to introduce more drugs to LA. <laughs> I guess, yeah. And no one, I mean, that's the thing. Probably, uh, I mean, the, yeah, again, I called America a failed state because of the coronavirus response, but yeah, nobody cares really about anything in uh, America. I mean, we've got some problems here in the UK. And, you know, the conservatives really rile us up sometimes, don't they, Michael? Yeah, we hate those they, Tories. They they really rile us up, but my God, like just the, the situation in America is is so bad. It is so, so bad compared to our country. Uh, and yeah, and uh, a movie isn't going to fix that. But you know what? It would be it would be a good movie, I reckon. It would be a good movie and timely, which matters in my opinion. Mm, that's true. I bet they had a lot of great yeah. plays in Rome before the end too. And that's really what we're, <laughs> we're about. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I mean, yeah, I know you're being, uh, or you're mocking the idea a bit. Uh, but yeah, it is something that, uh, if, if we are, cons- if we're talking about movies that should be produced, yeah, and there should there should be a movie on that. I mean, do we really need Michael another superhero movie? No, do we, we don't really need that. Maybe, maybe don't. though, the so, only yeah, solution though is to get a superhero movie about drugs. Yeah. You know, because yeah, nowadays the only way we can make films is by uh, having them make a superhero movie about it. Like Hollywood has to make movies, don't they? Yeah, that's the, they have to make movies. So if you've got to make a movie, make one about this. That's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, okay, so do you want to conclude, Michael? Now, uh, I've done that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me just have uh, a you, drink. So you you go first because I've talked for a while. So overall, basically, we've we've agreed on. Well, I've agreed with all your negatives, particularly the fact that the theme is a bit thin. Uh, it's kind of hard to identify anything there, like. I don't, I, I was actually reading somebody was saying, um, that, that they'd seen Requiem for a Dream four times in, in a week because they had to review it for, for English, like English class. You know, you've got to watch like a film for English and talk about it. I was thinking, I would not like to do that for this film because I don't think there's that much there. Uh, by contrast, for example, my sister did media studies. She had to watch, um, uh, American Beauty. There's loads in American Beauty, but in this film, there's, there's not that much there really in terms of themes. Um, and it does all kind of feel pretty surface level. In a way, it kind of feels a bit I'm 14 and this is deepy, where it's like, oh man, what if what if there's loads of things which are drugs, man? And if you're not going to explore it much beyond that, I can't really respect it too much. Um, the visuals are really interesting and good, but ultimately, you know, Dovsky has other films which also have decent visuals. And I'd say they're all on balance better than this. Uh, and for me, obviously, the big thing is that when it came to the plot, I really couldn't connect to it. I, I really, like, I struggled. And I think you kind of, in a way, touched on it by saying, like, it doesn't show you how these characters got to this point. For me, I didn't really, I couldn't see these characters as real people just because they felt like vessels for this story, which sort of felt ham-fisted in its approach and a bit like there wasn't much nuance or anything like that. So for me, I struggled to connect to it. And ultimately, therefore, when the goofier things happened, uh, I, I did, I did find them funny. And obviously, that's, that's not good because this is supposed to be a very kind of serious art film. And at some points, my reaction was like as if I was watching The Room, which is a really serious insult to level against a esteemed director, indie director, Darren Aronofsky. And yet it's true, like there were some moments in this film that were literally so bad that I laughed and found them funny. And that is just insane. And with that in mind, I think the problem is like, this film did so much to not want that to happen. And therefore I kind of have to think this film is not very good at all, which is, I I will admit, like it's a subjective thing. A lot of that I think is to do with my psychology and the way I relate to the film. But overall, I'm gonna have to put it Below, ah, oh, I don't want to be too horrible, but I think I'm going to put it near, um, Oceans 12, uh, but below Captain America Civil War. So that's, uh, Requiem for a Dream. Oh, I also say this. Requiem for a Dream is a really good title. Like, it's a really good kind of, just, just title right there. Requiem for a Dream. And I feel like it was kind of wasted yeah. on this film. 
You know, like I feel like that's that's just like a really good title. So I think you know they should have saved no, you're it for right. a it is, it is a very good title. Um, so again, I you know there was some goofy elements as well, but I wasn't. I was more invested in, in the story than you, so I didn't laugh out loud. Uh, I guess when uh, they were happening. Uh, and as you said, the visuals were good, but visuals, you know, on their own don't make a movie. The more important things are the themes. There are themes and there are in this movie. And yeah, it, this movie, like you say, it doesn't show how characters got to this part of three out of four of them, which is an issue. And, you know, it's, it is a very, it has a very simple message. Addiction is awful and drugs are bad. Uh, and like you said, you, you can't really be a serious art film or a highly rated art film if that is the the message uh if, if, if that's it i mean look how low people can sink because of addiction I mean, they can prostitute themselves they can get amputated they can end up in jail or in a mental asylum yeah okay they can that that is not false but it's, it's got to be more to that like how did they end up there surely that's the more interesting question and i, I do you know I, this movie could have been i think really good if they if darren aronofsky you know did a movie about how or all corners of society, like this movie, all the characters from different corners of society, you'd say, uh, how they all fall into drugs and the reasons uh, they fall into drugs. And, you know, it's well, it's probably, um, you know, kind of obvious. It's because of society and the faults that society has, which I think is a very, very valid critique of America, uh, that they have quite a few faults in their society. So that would be a, a good thing to talk about, a good thing to, uh, you know, discuss in, in a movie. Um, and especially given the opioid crisis now, it is even more relevant to discuss in a movie. Sadly, that doesn't happen. And, uh, yeah, it's, you know, it's interesting, I guess, to explore the psychology of people. Uh, you know, if, if that's interest to you, then okay, fine. But again, I, I don't think it really does that, to be honest. Um, it's, it, it's, it, the psychological elements of the film is all oh, look how crazy drugs can make you, which is, is well known. So if that's just it, then yeah, like you said, I can't give it that higher rating. Um, so what am I gonna give it, Michael, out of ten? What do you give it out of ten? I actually okay, this is this is bad. I think I don't know. You're gonna, but I actually gave it a high three. Oh wow, yeah, I'm not gonna be. Yeah, that I harsh didn't think it. it would be. That yeah, that is that is extremely harsh. I was thinking about five out of ten. Yeah, I mean to be fair, like when you think about it, five out of ten, and then a high three. Really, there's only a a point difference, and then it's almost a four. Oh, that's my compliment for it. It's almost a four. It's it's almost a four. Uh, I'm just thinking of other movies. I give a five out of ten. Uh, you know what? I'm going to bump it up to a five point five. Okay. I think that seems reasonable to me, given the other movies. I have given a five, which yeah. I think this movie is better than them. So five point five out of ten for Requiem for a Dream. I think again, it could have been really good, but yeah, as as I've talked about, it wasn't uh, because it didn't really go into that much detail and depth, uh, apart from a surface level critique of how drugs are bad and addiction is bad. Yeah. And that's all you got. How how how. I can really rate it. Uh, so yeah, what are we doing next week, Michael? Well, next week, as I think you already uh, said, we're going to be looking at Showgirls. Um, yes, we are. So yes, just, showgirls. yeah, like, oh, I feel like we've, we're, we're doing some real downers. We kind of went from like Batman Forever, the most goofy, insane film in the world. Was this movie a downer? Well, see, obviously, <laughs> obviously, like, uh, I, I had a slightly different experience with it than the average person. But I could acknowledge on an objective level it was in the more downer territory. And you look at like 365 mm-hmm. days, like, I, I think if you ignore so bad it's good elements and just focus on kind of the aspect of it, I feel like 365 days was pretty much a downer. Wrecked for a Dream was a mm-hmm. downer. Showgirls, it's kind of a downer. Leaving Las Vegas, a downer. And don't even get me started on Caddyshack. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah, I, I did see an article, by the way, on Requiem for a Dream. It was from The Independent. And it was about a Twitter conversation about uh, people were asking what is the greatest movie you never want to see again, and or a, a great movie, and uh, Requiem, yeah. Requiem for a Dream won. And I would say, yeah, I can understand you never wanting to see it again. I get that. Obviously, you found bits of it funny, uh, but I would not call it a, a great movie. Uh, but no, yeah. yeah, the fact that I never want to see it again doesn't factor into my rating of the movie. I don't think it should. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, uh, I wonder what's the best like, movie I'd never want to see again. Oh, that that is a fascinating. Question. We should think about it and bring it in as our, our homework for next week, in case we again don't have a very good uh, cold open. Which will probably be the case because nothing yeah. is happening. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for listening. We've been selecting and reflecting on Requiem for a Dream. Uh, yeah. Um, a movie which yeah is unique but I think could have been quite a bit better uh, in several areas uh, join us next week for and it's a memorable movie which of course matters quite a bit uh, join us next week for Showgirls 
another memorable movie. Uh, who have you been, Michael? I've been Michael. I've been Luke. Thanks for listening and goodbye. Goodbye.